So you're John Alston. That is technically correct. You're a film school graduate. Oh, yeah. That, technically that's correct. Like, that's awesome. Yeah. 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 And uh, you and I see the world similarly, I've noticed. Oddly, um, yeah. Yeah. Like patterns, um, drama, especially when it comes to film. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, some of the things that I've seen you do, like some of the obstacles that you've encountered in your life. Yeah. You've found things that bring you peace. Oh, definitely. And one of those things was stop motion animation. Oh, boy. Of all things, right? It's a, it's a dying art, which I really appreciate because I like tomahawk throwing. I like these I like starting <laughs> fires with flint and steel. I like, I like the lost arts that still have a place in the world. And I think you found one that I had overlooked. And that's just really cool. So just tell us a little bit about yourself and what, how did you come across stop motion? It's complicated because the thing is stop motion is part of, I think, everyone's life. If you've lived in the 90s, you've seen commercials, you've seen um, things. But I think it came into fruition when I realized I couldn't make the student film that everyone else was making. Like, I, you know, it's like I wanted, it's, you know, the thing is, Student narratives are usually very dramatic and they, they are very real world oriented. And I'm like, give me something fake. What, yeah. what can be more fake than something that can only move if you make it move? Mm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Now, why stop motion rather than uh, 2D animation? Well, because it, with 2D animation, you can't, you can, but, you know, the thing is, you've got Roger Rabbit doing that. But, like, the the thing is, with stop motion, you can use it in, as effect, and pretty much no one else is going to use it that way. You mm -hmm. know? That's true. That's true. Now, we saw stop motion die right around Jurassic Park. That, right? was a, that was a clicker. Yeah, Jurassic Park was originally supposed to be a stop motion animation film. Steven Spielberg, I think, in one featurette I saw, was saying he wanted to make the ultimate stop motion film. I, I think he should have done that after he made Jurassic Park, but... Oh well, <laughs> yeah, you know, because I think the CGI tests do look better, and I I say this with with anguish in my soul. I'm like, okay, the, every every person who's working with models is like, John, why did you say that? <laughs> I'm like, because I think the muscular nature of CGI is that even though it doesn't move quite at what quite as well, it adapts to lighting of of the environments well because the thing is with stop motion you have lights and they're real lights but you're putting a miniaturized thing in a different lighting condition mm. so with cgi you can use a similar lighting condition and it's actually more realistic oh but now now the, there go the pitchforks um oh no there's i so my theory is there are more people out in the world like you and i than the world realizes. Oh, definitely. And they're, they're looking for people like us to start saying some of these things. Oh, yeah. Um, so, favorite stop motion film? Oh, f favorite stop motion yeah. film? Just stop motion or everything? Well we'll, 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 we'll pigeonhole it. We'll go to stop motion only and then we'll go everything. Oh. I can't name it everything. I, uh, stop motion only, it's, it's going to sound silly, but Chicken Run, ironically. Chicken Run. Like, as a now feature film, like, I'm like... That's Mel Gibson starring as the rooster, right? Yeah, he's yeah. the rooster. And it's... When you watch that film, you're like, this wouldn't be good if it wasn't stop motion. But something about it being stop motion made the film likable. That's interesting. Because you know? take the stop motion away, and it's just a second-rate great escape. With chickens. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so perfect. The only thing it was missing was the green motorcycle. I mean, I, you, you do have uh, Rocky the... You're, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Now the, now all the animators are like, why? You, you uncovered our secret. Yeah. Like um, Iron Man 3 is just The Incredibles. Oh, the, well, The Incredibles is just a really good Watchmen movie. Ooh. Ooh, dang. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, man, that is such a good point. 
Now, Watchmen, that's Snyder, isn't it? Oh, Watchmen is the one Snyder film I'll defend. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's not looked in the right way. How do you say? Or how so? Um, because superhero movies are a genre. They aren't, they do not exist as a piece of independent work. Com superhero comics are variety because writers are insane. And so they have Spider-Man <laughs> take over Doc Ock's body or vice versa. And people say it's a good idea because they just want people to read the things. But with superhero movies, they're four families, mostly. They're four people who want to have fun, so they're mostly light movies. Okay. And, and with Watchmen, it exists technically in that genre, but it's not like the other genre entries. No, because at the time, I mean, you weren't... I mean, we had Batman, right? Batman, yeah. Batman is dabbling in the dark, but it's not as dark as that. We had Punisher. No. Punisher Warzone, I think, went that dark. But Maybe. I don't know that I it was... It. I still haven't seen it, right? No, so I and don't... I feel bad because it was... um, What's her face? The stunt coordinator. Uh, it was her... I think it was her first direct... Uh, first film she directed. Oh, wow. Um, and I really liked the idea of a stunt coordinator directing an action oh, film. Oh, that's what they should do. Like... Right? You know, the the new Left Behind, I'm sure it's garbage, but it was directed by Vic Armstrong, who did the stunts in Indiana Jones. Oh, that's cool. So I, I'm like, I bet the action's great, and maybe that's it. I think there's an appreciation for practical effects coming from the Oh, the there's there's love. It's beyond appreciation. It's like, there there's this Ghostbusters commercial, and it, they have a person in a costume, and I'm like, CGI would look better. And I say that <laughs> as I love stop motion and work with it. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's practical for practical sake, not because it looks better, you know? Yeah. Um, but practicals can look better. It depends on the thing. Well, coming back to Jurassic Park, I think that's where the, the original Jurassic Park is still my favorite. Oh, yeah. And the reason for that is because CGI was so hard to do, yeah. so expensive. You had to do it in limited Increments, yeah. Increments, yeah. And then when you did it, you wanted it to be perfect. Oh, you had to you have it. You wanted it to be perfect. And if you look at the effects in Jurassic Park versus Lost World, the lighting's wrong uh -huh. in Lost World. The skin looks sleeker. It doesn't look like it's got that texture. And in looking back, you know, growing up, I was trying to figure out why that was. And it was, you were using puppets. Oh. You were you like... You were using stop motion in one scene, I believe, isn't it? With the, Literally the hatching the, scene, yeah. The kitchen. Isn't the kitchen scene No, it's still not. CGI? It's CGI. It's a lot of puppet work, it's too. It's real though. puppets, but it's it's not stop motion. Um, but, but it is a mix of CGI raptors and puppet people in raptor costumes. Yes! And, yeah, should we... Is it too light to mention that they were probably naked? Um it doesn't really matter. Like, it doesn't I, matter. I would be naked Raptor. in that suit because that would be <laughs> so hot. Like, okay. I'm thinking Mop 4 with my gas mask on out in the desert kind of oh, hot. It would be just like, nasty. Crammed in that back problems, I, I don't, you know. The thing, I bet the thing is the people who did it knew their jobs would get phased out in a year. Like, it's really sad. But It was like, a last hurrah, I think, for yeah. stop motion as an art form. Except... It created a new field. It was, uh, what did they end up coining it? The, the chief stop motion animator ended up becoming the the animal behaviorist. Oh, yeah, Phil Tippett? Yeah, that's yeah. funny. Which he created a new genre. Now you need that same eye that understood how things moved to mold the computer world, the next generation of animation. It went from a last hurrah to the birth of a brand new field. Oh, yeah. And in a lot of ways. And in a way, I think what 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 the computers have done is created situations where people aren't impressed by seeing worlds bend. It's like, oh, we got to have more worlds bend and planets bending and everything flying at each other. And the thing is, what happens is people are. It's almost like they're afraid to care about something that's little. Oh no, that's just one family in danger, mm -hmm. you know. And it's it's kind of a fear of the world not ending. Right. And so, look at the Oscar nominees for best film this year. Oh. Uh, 
It was Ford versus Ferrari. Okay. Uh, didn't they get a Best Picture uh, nomination? Nom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they got what I thought they deserved. They got Best Sound Editing and Best Editing. Oh, cool. Which I thought they killed it. Uh, if you don't know, I'm a huge fan of the film. They used a lot. But the, the point is, these were not high CG movies. They were, like, I, I, who else was nominated? Oh. I don't even know. Like, oh. I don't care. This is... It was a Ford versus Ferrari. I'm good. But it, they were using lots of practical effects. They were using that that tactile. And I think as we've reached out and touched the stars with cyberspace, yeah. now we're starting to rebound. I I think it it, it works for like the puppetry, but I, I don't think it works for a little stop motion guy because stop motion guy is like, it's kind of like if I can do stop motion and do it as a cartoon, I'll do that because it'll have a appreciation. But with stop motion live action, it's like I've been trying to <laughs> to wrangle six or seven people to get on a Facebook group, and and it's like you're my fan. Like <laughs> you're like I'm literally trying to reach out to all the animators in the world that still do that, mm -hmm. and there's like seven. <laughs> yeah, no, that comes uh, back to the point. It's a it's a dying art that really shouldn't be. No, it shouldn't be, because anyone can do it. And the, the care in each movement. Oh, yeah. It's one of my favorite parts about it. You, the, the intention with everything, the, the, the working, working it with your hands, the connection with the art. It's just beautiful. I mean, it has to be, <laughs> or nobody cares. It's another bad Lego movie. You know? Oh, oh, bad Lego movie. Man, he went there. I mean... So the thing is, you don't want to be on YouTube because YouTube is where, pe you know, families upload their bad home movies. Mm. You know, you it's America's funniest home videos, but but you can have really good produced or really, really well produced uh, productions. Oh yeah. But it's mixed in with all the yeah, funniest yeah. home videos. With Vimeo, no one, nobody does it but other filmmakers. So it's it's like a graveyard that everyone should do, but. You know. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I love everything that I see on Vimeo. I love what I love is the the audience. They're just like supportive. It's like if if one of our things were to die, like one of the the lights, they would be like, "Oh, you lost a lot." Like this is what we need to do to to keep it on. And but YouTube would be like, "LOL, fail." You know. Yeah, yeah. Which I, you know, I'm kind of a dark humor guy, and that's, oh, that's one of the funny. reasons I enjoy being on YouTube. It's like, go ahead and make fun of it. I'm making fun of it, too. Trust oh, me, that. you're not going to critique it nearly as bad as I'm critiquing it in my own head. Uh -huh. I'm I'm my worst critic all the time. Um, so I just have fun with it. All the other comments are just like, yep, yeah, fail. It was hilarious. <laughs> fail! <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. Low budget, low budget production here. Yeah, I mean, and the, the trouble with low budget productions is it actually has to do with two numbers, $50 and $300. Mm. You're constantly battling those two numbers. Oh, tell me about that then. Uh, what $50 or $300, you're talking about like to buy a light? Oh, no, to buy everything. Because the thing is, with, with, with an art film, you can do it... Oh, sorry. That's fine. Um, you can do it... It's as, just the Holy Grail. Oh, yikes. Um, <laughs> the Grail. <laughs> Oh, that's so weird. Uh, <laughs> Connery impression, like... Some call me... Tim? <laughs> but, like, the thing is, with with an art film, you can make it as little as $50. Hmm. But the trouble is... The, the following isn't going to be there. Hmm. And so that is that is what it is. So what do you think of um, Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog? Oh, Dr. Harbaugh, the thing about that is it's a writer strike show, and once you realize that, you'll realize why it's kind of a lightning in a bottle type thing. Yeah, they're going to do a sequel, and I don't know... No. Nah. I don't know that we should be. No, I, it's very contained. It doesn't mm -hmm. need it. It's, we were talking about Firefly earlier for the same reasons. It's it there Something was born there, I think, in the struggle against the network, and, for instance... Nathan Fillion was talking about how Joss wrote Mal to be really dark and depressed all the time and just this this brooding character and Nathan's like I just that's not me I don't 
I don't think I can find that in uh-huh. me. And so what you ended up with was uh, whatever came out of the tug and pull of the tug of war between the writer wanting to make a brooding character and Nathan Fillion, who's constantly hilarious. Uh, well, that kind of happened with Groundhog Day. Oh. Oh. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Like, this is... The thing is, Bill Murray was had it with his Ghostbuster type thing. He So he wanted to make it a really dramatic film. But um, Egon... Oh, he died, and I'm sad. It was so, sad. Yeah. So, but Egon wanted to make it a comedy, which... To me, it's it's both movies, but it's a better drama than a comedy. Yeah, I, so it's Evolution. Are you familiar with this one? What is that? David Duchovny, Sean William Scott, um, Orlando Jones. Oh, wow. Oh, uh, what's her face? I can't remember her name. Um, but it started out as a serious script about aliens landing on the planet and evolving on the planet and trying to take it over. And they decided to rewrite it as a comedy. Oh, that's funny. And there, it was. It might have been the same guy. It's Reitman. All right. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, so it, and it, you could tell it didn't know what it wanted to be. And Groundhog Day didn't have that problem. No, it didn't. It yeah. sagged. What's that one that uh, Nimoy did too? Didn't he do the Three Men and a Baby? Yes. Or... Yes. Like, where did that come from? I mean, it just it's another example. I think of what we're talking about where two chemicals that wouldn't necessarily mix end up creating something spectacular. I mean... N- not it, that Three Men and a Baby is spectacular, but it's, well, it's the thing good. Is, the thing is, I think w- with with stop motion, the, the issue is the people who like it the most are already doing it. And the people who dislike it, you know, they, they it's like... They're, I think the people who dislike it are just really curmudgeoning, but th- there aren't those mi- that many people. It's just the trouble with medium today is that if a person really cares about an a- animation medium, he's probably an animator. Like, mm. it's it's like, you know, in a perfect world, people would be like, oh, I like the brush strokes of this film, but that's not what people see. They see the story, so, you know... Yeah, yeah, and we we touched on um, the Marvel movies, or oh, not Marvel, Marvel, but just superheroes in general. Oh, super superheroes are complicated because superhero movies are not the same thing as superhero comics. No, they're not. They're no, they're modern myth, as far as yeah. I can tell. Superhero movies are kind of a feel good escape from reality. Hmm. Generally speaking, in game, not counting, but like. The movies Fair that, yeah. Winter but, Soldier, I really thought went. Winter Soldier surprised me with how dark it went. I was like, oh snap! They decided to make a really good film. Forget a really good superhero movie. They made a really good movie. Oh yeah, it's it's in my top ten. I could. Is it really? Yeah, it's in my top ten superhero movies. Wow. Um. Well, you know, you've got Captain America versus George St. Pierre, which is pretty cool. You, cool. Former UFC champion. That's oh, your, awesome. Yeah. Um. What's his name? Um. Oh, the French guy on the ship at the beginning that they end up having to take out. Bart up, Bart, Bart. What was his name? What film? Winter Soldier. Oh. Towards the beginning. Towards the beginning. I don't they, know. They have to raid a ship. Um, I'm going to put it in the... You know what? We're just going to put it in the... Uh, Archives. Yeah, it's going to be in the notes down at the bottom. I'll figure it out. Bart, 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 Bart what? Oh, I can't remember his huh. name. Anyway, but it, yeah, it was former former UFC champion George's oh, cool. Saint Pierre. He might still be reigning. I don't think anybody took the title from him. Oh, that's awesome. But yeah, and it was a, a proper fight. That was when we started seeing the shield getting used properly too. Oh, yeah. oh my to me, gosh! The the part in Civil War where the shield gets shattered a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's like I think that mo- part is like what people wish comic books were, you know? Maybe. <laughs> so comic books are, you know, you've got two different audiences there, I think. Yeah. You've got the people that wish it was that. Yeah. Then you've got the the hyper-creative types. Oh, no, they, that are they ex- go crazy. That are experimenting with new ways to tap into the same themes. Oh, yeah? Um, and there's going to, I mean, you're going to have like a 1% hit rate on that. 
But no. there's nobility in trying, I think. Oh, yeah. Speaking of nobility, Dragonheart. Dragonheart. I, I hated that movie. I, oh. I think that within every scene, there's a scene that, that looks like it could have been better, but it seemed like it's earnest entertainment. Like, it's, it's got Sean Connery, it's Knights, it's... They tried hard. They tried really, they really tried hard. They really, tried really, really hard. The scale of it is really big. I don't think the, uh, I don't think the story was, was, um, in, I don't, I think it was... But it's the I think you act. got browbeat with it. Like, it was all too literal. They didn't, they didn't distill it enough to where you just were left to the imagination on some of the, the the interpretations of what they were trying to do. I mean, do. okay, this might uh, might go into a different category, yeah. but the trouble the trouble with theme-driven criti- criticism is that if you aren't careful, you may be remaking a movie to match your ideas. So it's like mm-hmm. you're judging a film not based on what it is, but what you want it to be. And then it's like, I judge all films that way. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, you're a filmmaker. That's what filmmakers do. They're like, that shot was too long. That take was too weird. That scene was too... The pacing was off. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I do that. I, I've got my own version of how Anakin became Darth, for instance, which I shared oh, with you one God. time. You know, I, I pick those apart. I do tend to find an appreciation for what is created though. I'm I've been called a lover of all movies, oh, especially bad ones. I mean bad like, movies. Well, I, it, they, the difference between a bad movie and a good movie is literally the screenwriter knowing what he's doing, but it's not like maybe I I pull out nuggets. Like so in Ultraviolet for instance. Oh, wow, you're get, getting deep. Right? Hey. Ultraviolet. <laughs> um that's uh Kurt Vimmer. Right in a with a oh. movie that he wrote and directed for Mila Jovovich. Oh snap! Right, it's so you've already set a high expectation oh, for dude. your film, right? He uses his gun katas in a way, you know, from Equilibrium, the martial oh, yeah, arts mix. Oh yeah, that was cool. Which one of the coolest fights in all of film? Oh, I think is the pistol fight at the end of e- Equilibrium. I think the trouble with Equilibrium is it had the perfect second act finisher and the pistol fight couldn't be as good as that because it's this really long scene with katanas swirling around with almost no cutting yeah and like i think it's a fake one -er. i like the pistol fight at the end i thought that was the perfect uh i thought culmination of everything because it was a knife fight but with range like surprise range and for me as with a little the tiny little bit of fighting background i've got and the tiny little bit of weapons background I've got, um, it built a tension for me. Like, oh snap! Like, you don't know. Oh, it's there's this pause in the middle where there's no gunfire, and you're going, w- w- where is wait, it? Wait, wait, What's going to happen? Gun- When's it going to happen? Versus, you know, they could have done what the Matrix did with Neo versus Agent Smith in the subway. Ah, uh, yeah. That's where good. it was a, a it was a great Western showdown, but with running and getting all the way up to the gun to the head part. That was a great take on it, and I think that might be what you're kind of describing is the nice long shots that kind of live up to the. Long I don't shots know. I guess play. I think it had a better climactic fight before the action one, and if they just reversed the order around. The fight against all the guards was really cool. Yeah. Especially the the use of the sheath, I, fantastic, and then to the the very next fight being him versus Tay Diggs, and it's a a one two three. We're done, straight up anime style to the point of you mm. had the delayed drip of blood from the sword. Oh yeah. And then the delayed face sliding off. Oh yeah. Right? It was like, what? It's they went it, straight anime with that. It's the thing is, up into the point, it's it's an R that forgets it's an R until the face slide and then you're like, Well, there it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean if I'm gonna critique that movie, there's one thing I'll critique it on because I like Bill Fickner too. I uh-huh. like it, if he shows up, I already like the movie. Oh Batman. Snap. Batman, uh, The Dark Knight. Bill Fickner is the mob boss banker. Yeah, he's and I'm like, I know like I'm gonna love minutes. this. I know I'm gonna love this movie. I know I'm gonna love this movie because Bill Fickner showed up. Um, they, I don't know why they did it. I don't know if they were aiming for a rating or what. But if you look, all the blood spray from the gunshots is like a dust gray. Ah, that's funny. 
and in the super clean environment that they were in, like it was ecumenical to the extreme, right? Where's all that dirt, dirt coming from? Uh, they're getting like the the guards all clean and like they're they're polished. They're literally polished. Where did that dust come from? <laughs> it's like, uh, did we just forget to color the gray as red in post production? I mean, uh, what happened there? But I was going to ask you about um, projectiles in stop motion. Oh, we were talking about the shield earlier, and that got me thinking. Like, how when you're doing stop motion, how would you get Captain America's shield to go from here to there and then bounce off of something? I've always wondered how you get that to hover. Um. Well, let's see. The thing is, I haven't done that yet, but if I were to do it, I'd probably have a rig and animate it on the rig with a thing and and then key out the rig somehow. And it wouldn't be a huge deal, but it would be something that would be hard to do if you were doing it for a long period of time and just doing the movement right, because if you get the movement wrong, the physics are gone, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, what do you think they would have done before green screen, though? What? Because we can we can erase, like, we we could put it in a, a green screen rig if we wanted to and just er put the set back in digitally. Well, what they would digitally. do is they would use rear projection early mm. on, you know? Yeah. And the thing is... The, the trouble is there would be inconsistency between the plates, so it, it doesn't hold up as much on HD transfers, but, like, it, it looks fine. Yeah. No, I was just curious. That's cool. Where should we go next? Oh. It's your turn to lead. Oh, my turn. <laughs> oh, the, the Dark Knight. The Dark Knight? The Dark Knight. Oh, no, I'm happy to go with the Dark Knight. Oh, snap. That's, that's a favorite of mine. Oh, it's an awesome movie. It's an awesome movie, but I'm not over the moon with it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, why? Because I think the, the reason I'm not over the moon with it is because I think, because it's such a good crime drama, I think it, it doesn't, it, it kind of leads by standing while the superhero movies sit instead of standing alongside the crime dramas that are also standing up, you know? Hmm, okay. So it's like, okay, maybe you should judge it by other crime dramas and, you know. Yeah, it did kind of fit in its own little in-between world there, didn't it? Yeah. It wasn't quite... Because I heard Christopher Nolan wanted to do everything as if it would, was going to happen in the real world. He didn't want it to be taking place in a superhero world. He did it 90% time, and then the 10% I'm like... Oh, yikes, the genre won't say. Where's some of the 10%? I think the part that I actually hate is when, let's see, this is a little bit of a performance, um, is when Batman's like, no, I won't give in, and he just steps back and trips everyone up. How, if you have a wire, um, how do you get it to tangle around the feet all the time? Maths. Huh? It's showing off how brilliant Bruce Wayne was. <laughs> He's the great detective. He it was a mystery he figured out. Uh, like, what, how do they all tangle up at the same time without anyone dislodging it or circulation being cut off? Like, yeah, that's that's probably like the deepest criticism. But that's not superhero. That's Die Hard. That's action movie. Yeah, so yeah. That, I can see where that's still holding true to his rule of not going into you know, superhero realm, right? This isn't, I mean, it's Last Action Hero, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, it's yeah, kind of over the top. Yeah, but the trouble is, it's like, I can let that be a point of contention because I'm judging it by the standards that it was up until that point, you know? That's fair. It's a consistency issue. It's yeah. Not a, yeah it, if it the movie was more car the cartoony up to that point, I think it would not stand out as mm -hmm. being the worst scene in the movie. Yeah. Like, up until that point, I'm like, yeah, this is a great scene. And then he's like, step away from the line. And I'm like, oh, is he going to jump below and then save the day? No, he's going to create a cat's cradle. Yep. <laughs> and you're like, oh, Batman logic. Yeah. It became a Batman movie in the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. You think it was a hearkening back, or you think it was just a, a convenient? It's a convenience, because yeah. the thing is, he didn't want to do a scene where Batman's being a coward. 
And mm-hmm. so he decided to create a situation where Batman is able to outwit his opponent using the resources he has. Isn't that a staple of Batman, though? It is. But the trouble is, with that scene, you have to believe that the cable has a mind of Batman behind it and not is a cable that's just tripping everyone and tangling magically around their feet <laughs> yeah. like a magic carpet. Yeah. It, it's a cartoon for that minute. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, that minute is all it takes for me to get the immersion broken. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. It's the thing that pulls you out of yeah, I'm like, the world that had been created. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You know? So what, how did you do with Inception? Sticking with Christopher Nolan here. Oh, man. Bouncing over to another oh, one oh, no, created no. a world. Don't, we don't ask. We can't ask about Inception, but the thing is, Inception is where I think you see both Christopher Nolan's greatest strengths and his greatest weaknesses at the same movie. Interesting. So, strength. One's, one's I strength. think his strength is he makes time into a protagonist. That's where, a beautiful concept. Where he makes time into a... To, to the primary driver of events. And he's, it's almost like it's as much of a character as the people talking. And I think his greatest weakness is that his reliance on action basically means the movie is boring when it should be the most exciting. Like you have this nice set piece and you have the, the nice set. Like you don't have complex and and the thing is it doesn't have to be all like um jackie chan but it can't be like two guys just throwing each other that's kind of dullish for me yeah that's a little uh terminator 2 oh man t800 versus uh t1000 when there's just tossed to one side of the hallway <laughs> tossed to the other side of the hallway tossed through a wall <laughs> uh-huh. Nah, i did enjoy um and if you haven't seen it yet, Batman fights Jason Bourne in Ford versus Ferrari. Oh, it's not. Because oh, it's, it's Matt Damon and Christian Bale, and they get in a tussle. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's it's, wild. But it's not the, the fight that you would ever imagine. It was hilarious. It was just too funny getting outside of the, the movie for that moment and thinking, that's Batman versus Jason Bourne. Well, you know, the thing is, the sad thing is, I think movie Batman Jason Bourne would would, would win that one. But Interesting. Yeah, because Bourne, what Bourne does is he uses his environment as a weapon, mm-hmm. while Batman hopes he has a gadget to save the day. So, he doesn't hope he's got that magic utility belt that always has the gadget to save oh, the day. Oh, yeah, of course. Like bat shark spray <laughs> in, uh, the, <laughs> in the early Adam West Batman. I mean... Oh, it was so funny. That's the point, though. It's not trying to be a, a, a story that it isn't. But yeah, the thing is, with The Dark Knight, it's, it is a crime drama. And because it's a crime drama, we, we have to compare it to the greats. And if you think it holds up, that's okay. And if you don't think it holds up, that's also okay. <laughs> Cause yeah. I, I, I think it danced between the two. Oh, nice. Dancing in, dancing in the pale moonlight. You know? <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, <laughs> nice. yes. Very uh, nice. Um, you know, I think with the Burton films, they were their own thing, and you 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 could spend a lazy hour just debating the execution of their stories. But they they were Burton films. Well, it was you know? the first Dark Batman we saw too. So yeah, you can only knock it so much, right? It was, it it's what turned really superhero movies in general. I mean, you could argue Christopher Reeves. Um, no, it's Reeve one S. Chris, yeah, it's Christopher Reeve. Keanu Reeves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, cool breeze over the mountain, Reeves. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but Christopher Reeve in Superman did take superheroes, I think, to a blockbuster, blockbuster level. Oh, absolutely. And I think Batman was a great follow-up with that, with Michael yeah, Keaton. Yeah. And to get Jack Nicholson to play the Joker. Oh, man. He, still he, a favorite. Yeah, I mean, is there a bad Joker? Do, I mean, other than Jared Leto? Oh, the, the trouble I couldn't about, resist. <laughs> the trouble with Joker is I I feel like Joker is, is a lack of control versus control. So I don't know what a bad Joker would look like, you know. Whereas Batman, 
I think Batman is, is kind of control vote versus acting. And I think the trouble is the better the actor, the harder the person has at playing Batman. Mm. Uh, Christian Bale is definitely a better actor than Ben Affleck. But Ben Affleck did, you know, is better at not acting than <laughs> Christian Bale. So for Batman, I'm actually prefer how Batfleck feels. But the movies mm. were so bad, it's, it's not even fair to, <laughs> you know, it's, it'd be like, picking out a ruby in a uh, bucket of turd, you know? You yeah, know? yeah. In, in Batfleck's defense, right, He he's fantastic in Pearl Harbor as that natural... Oh, like, man. To your point, he's not... I don't feel like he's Batman or a pilot in that movie. I feel like I'm getting to know a genuine character that I care about. And same with uh, Armageddon, still one of my favorite oh, movies. Oh, he's good in Armageddon. Fantastic in Armageddon. It was a great role for him, especially early on. Cause he, oh, I he mean, came that chasing of... Amy, Amy era. Like, people say, oh, he's not very... Earned. And, like, you, you haven't seen his early roles, if you're saying that, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, chasing Amy. Uh, what are we going to go with? Um, uh, good Will Hunting. Like, same type of... Field of Dreams. Oh, he wasn't in that. Yeah, he was. He was? Yeah. What? Him and Matt Damon are sitting in the uh Whoa, in the stands. no, this is weird. No, they're just extras. Uh, they're just extras, but they're up hilarious. in the stands. That's hilarious. Yeah. I, I I'll have to see it again. Oh yeah, no, it's too funny. I mean but but, but yeah, the th- thing is Goodwill hunting, definitely. For Damon. The, the the thing is, with Batman, the the better the actor, the worse the Batman for some reason. Cause George Clooney's a decent actor, but he's 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 that, you Clooney. can't use you can't use Clooney though, oh. <laughs> because nobody appreciates that movie for what it was. Oh no, it's it's totally a toy commercial. Like that's interesting. That's what it is. It's I mean, a Happy Meal type. No, that's not what it was to me at all. Oh wow, it was modern Adam West. All snap. Okay. And if you think of it as that, with the camera angles, uh-huh, they nice. they captured it. They used. I mean, the bat credit card. Come on, the one-liners from oh, Arnold yeah, Schwarzenegger. Totally. Um, all that stuff. It was so purposefully over the top. I appreciated where they were coming from. I didn't appreciate the timing. Oh, wow. Okay, so you have a Batman and Robin apologist. Like, that's sure. that could be your heroism. Like, <laughs> <laughs> defend Batman. Like, <laughs> Clooney was a great Bruce Wayne. Oh, yeah. And he was a great Adam West Batman. Oh, huh? Nice. But you have to want the Adam West Batman. That's that's where the conflict is. It's like to me, that's what it. I think Val Kilmer did a really good job of riding that line. He kept oh, more yeah. of the Keaton Batman with some nods to Adam West in some moments. Yeah, but he was his own. I, I mean, Forever is weird because I'm like, it's it's like the fi- the cartoon you're embarrassed to show your parents, but you want to see by yourself. <laughs> That's what forever is. I like Tommy Lee Jones's Two Face. It was terrible, but whoa, I loved whoa, it. Whoa, 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 whoa! Oh, it. that hurt. That I, you made me want to cry. Like, <laughs> uh, to, to me, Tommy Lee Jones's he wasn't trying to make a good character. He was basically a parody. He was basically I want to be the Joker, but you hired me for this. I'll yeah. just. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's there. It's there. It's terrible. It's there. It's, you you see it yeah, on screen, and you're like. I, I hate to say it, but other than the really crap pop psychology that they were infusing that movie with, Ooh. he's the worst part of that movie. And I still like him, but I like him for really bad reasons. Oh, oh. It's just, it was good imagery. I thought he was a better Harvey Dent. I thought he looked the part a whole lot more well, than I, what we went with, with the Christopher Nolan thing. I think, though, the thing about Tommy Lee Jones is he's a really good actor. He He's very charismatic. He's very aggressive and he he can dial it back but he usually plays to that end um yeah if you haven't seen his movie man of the house where he's basically the main character oh snap and he's a an old u.s marshal trying to take care of a bunch of college cheerleaders that's funny it's just the funniest thing like at one point somebody says come on where's your happy face he's like this is my happy face (laughs) (laughs) it's just perfect it was, uh, apparently, he had a lot of influence in how that movie was done, too, I think. But I love him. I think he's great. And you were going somewhere with that. I'm sorry I derailed I, that. The, the thing is, what works for Batman doesn't work with the Joker and vice versa. I think with the Joker, the actor has to be very 
in tune to his limits because it's not a role that anyone should be able to play. I don't think it'd be responsible to let everyone play the Joker mm. because, mm -hmm. you know, with, with the Joker, you have to turn off your, your rationality. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to be happy, man. You know, mm -hmm. you, what you, what you have to do is basically turn out, turn off the part of you that's like, ooh, this is weird behavior, and mm -hmm. just let it all out there. And I think Luke Skywalker can do it, and <laughs> maybe Luke Skywalker is the only one I feel comfortable doing it. He's you got, know? So he brought the range that I think Ledger brought. That, yeah. That was what I really appreciated about Ledger's performance was yeah. we went with the really high, <laughs> <laughs> and then he would go, I'm a man of my word. And yeah. you get down in the basement, you're like, whoa, that felt demonic. Yeah, it's great, and I think that's what um, I think that's what Hamill introduced to the character through the animated series. Oh yeah, well, and and the thing about Hamill is he's the Joker. This is what I like about him, and I I, I don't want to cause death threats or or you know <laughs> that actually happened when the Dark Knight Rises came out. Mm -hmm. People. People went crazy when people yeah. wasn't getting 100% at Rotten Tomatoes. It's like, okay, it's a movie, you know. It's a movie. Yeah. But with with Mark Hamill's Joker, you can underestimate him until he <laughs> he messes you up. And the yes. thing is, with Heath Ledger's Joker, he's so serious that it's hard to imagine someone seriously underestimating him in real that's life. Fair. Like he's I guess he's too good in his role, and that's a yeah. good problem to have. But. No, that w that is something. That's a really good point because one of the things that I was trying to figure out and put my finger on about Hamill is why do I like him so much? Why does he feel so surprising? He does it's feel because surprising. because every now and then, it's like, oh, we're just kind of doing our hunky-dory thing. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, yeah I could hang out with this guy. And oh, then no. And suddenly, he's trying to drop you in acid. It's, whoa, where did that come from? And that's it, that. I think that was his manic nature. Like, he's up, man. he's down, he's... I mean, it's just that intense pull in all directions. And the trouble, the, the trouble with Hamill is he does such a good job that I think the, the that the thing is, if if you say he's the best Joker, it's it's almost like what? Well, no, I'm not meaning that Heath Ledger is less of a Joker than he was. Ledger 110 percent deserved that Oscar award. But I, I think what Hamill brings to the role is a sense that he could be a regular person, but chooses not to be. Yeah, so this and, is where I'm going to get in trouble. Oh, okay. I don't think Ledger would have gotten the Oscar if he had been alive. <gasps> oh, no, you said it. You oh, said I'm going to say it. Oh. Because Robert Downey Jr. was also nominated for Best Supporting Actor that year for... Lincoln Osiris. Oh no, no, in no! Tropic Thunder. <laughs> oh, that's weird. And we, they were going there. Like, oh no, no! Did the they... whole like this is. I mean, even though it was blackface in a lot of ways, somehow it wasn't offensive. They tapped into something that was just amazing for that movie. And I think Robert Downey, he plays an Australian guy in that movie. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Playing a black guy the wrong way, right? Well, that's funny. He's, he's Uncle Tom in it way too much. And on purpose, because that was the point of the character, and that's why he gets checked for it later. Oh, wow. And then he also plays a, um, is he a, is he a, an English Catholic, pr no, he's an, he's a, he's a, uh, Scottish. That's funny. Priest in that, the fake trailer at the beginning. That's funny. And if you watch the commentary, he stayed in character for the commentary too. He That's stayed insane. true to the character. He's like, no, nah, man, I don't drop character until I do the DVD commentary. And it's like, he didn't. No, that awesome. <laughs> often. It was brilliant. And I, to me, I don't know. What do you think? Is he, Ledger went hardcore for Joker. It was a fantastic performance. I'm not knocking the performance at all. I, I, but the dynamics that RDJ brought. I think the trouble, though, is this goes into to the acting category. Is it's actually harder to be a comedic actor than it is to be that type of serious. Yeah, a nightmare. Joker. Yeah, nightmare. yeah. Which that was um, the Long Halloween. I think was the primary inspiration for this Joker. Oh, yeah, you read which that is one? Still my favorite Joker. Yeah, that the Long Halloween. 
almost deserves its own podcast. Like, I don't remember it that yeah. well, but like, we but, could do we could do the long Halloween for Batman. We could do the five nightmares with uh, Iron Man. No, that's and nice. That would be a five episode series. Yeah, I <laughs> that. But the, the thing about Long Halloween is it's about how how the criminals who create Gotham has have essentially create created control. Mm-hmm. You know, they're the ones that are making sure the masks aren't terrorizing the city and then as batman <laughs> takes the down the criminals one by one you know gotham becomes this war city yep you know and it's it's the best batman movie never made like yeah like if i don't it, know that you can make that movie i i don't think you can because it relies on being a comic being its most comic book so long form then if we did it as a netflix series oh or a prime series or whoever could it be done? Oh, Netflix limited twelve issues, twelve episodes an issue. I think it could, but they, Netflix wouldn't have the rights to it. It's WB property. Well, it'd be Disney Disney Plus. Okay, Disney buys out Would Batman it? in this alternate. Because they're going to buy everything, right? They will. Yeah. They're, so it's just a matter of time. You just Disney crush Batman. DC a little bit longer until they're cheap enough to buy. Yeah. And then buy them and just be done, and then you own it all. Yeah, that's. Like, what won't they own after they buy DC? I think they want to own, and this is going to get me in trouble, but uh, Pornhub. Like, Disney will not buy <laughs> Pornhub. I... <laughs> I love it. Okay, no, yeah. that's the one. The, they'll buy it through Miramax or something oh. like that. <laughs> that's so gross. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And they'll consider it independent film. Yeah, making. independent. It's like Fox Searchlight. Oh, <laughs> d- gross. Oh, oh. oh gosh. Um, Suddenly, it's an R-rated episode. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. <laughs> oh man. So I wanted to find where were we going to go next? We were going to talk about we talked about some animation. Oh, I was curious. So I'm seeing some animation stuff oh. coming back. I'm seeing some 2D. I'm seeing some stop motion, kind of creeping back in. Oh. Partly because I'm hanging around you and I'm looking for it. Hardly, oh, right? nice. And. Where do you see it going? Like, what can we do with it now? What What would a revival of stop motion look like to you? A, a revival of stop motion to me would be... Well, I don't think it would be a series or... I think a revival of stop motion to me would be a company besides Lakia in America making a stop motion animated movie. What kind of stories would they tell? I don't know. <laughs> I Interesting. Haven't... No, uh, so I've seen some work where it's stop motion, but it's two dimensional paintings. Oh, that's that counts. I mean, yeah. that's it's not object animation, but it's it's kind of a time lapse type. I mean, I would really like to see. I mean, we're rebooting everything. Yeah. What if we rebooted Godzilla and King Kong with stop motion? Like, what could we do with that now? I wonder. Oh, we could. What we could do. Okay, this is when I get all weird. Um, <laughs> oh, this is when you get weird. Yeah. <laughs> I like to think that you're as weird as I am all the time. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, what we do is we we use the 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 Mandalorian rear projection technology. Yeah. For the city, we um, I think Godzilla, uh, King Kong would have to be a CG thing because I think as he moves through space, um, the the thing is he would have to move faster than Godzilla. But Godzilla yeah. could be a practical character, and I think the thing is, with Godzilla, if you were, wanted to do stop motion, you could do like a hatching scene. I think there's not enough interest for people to greenlight a full-on movie. Oh, with... what? So, I, I mean, coming back to where we started with the Jurassic Park thing, I think that's where we should be, that's what we should be doing with the technologies. I think... We should be mixing some stop motion with some puppeteering, with oh, some yeah. CG, with some 2D. Oh, like, yeah. I mean, there's so many tricks that you can bring to bear. Why does any one have to be the end-all, be-all for your film? Oh, oh, no. I mean, the the thing is, I think the the thing is, the answer is money. And <laughs> that's, that's kind well, of... Obviously, you want it to sell, right? But this is proof 
you have an idea, you can make it. Oh, yeah. That it is may good. not be an Oscar winner, but uh, uh, there's a soul in each art creation, I think, if you're doing it right. Oh, yeah. That the world is better for having. Oh, definitely. So now that things have gotten so much cheaper, like I have an entire three camera setup studio in my garage. Imagine saying that to Doc Brown in 1955 where right. he was impressed with the shoulder <laughs> VHS cam, right? Uh, do you see more homegrown stuff showing up? More guys in their garage doing their own thing? Like You're working on some projects right now, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's funny, but I'm actually working on a 2D short, so I'm like, that that's something that I'm like, okay, that's something school hasn't taught me. <laughs> I have to teach myself. You know? Yeah, but you were also working. I mean, you've got some others on the back burner oh, as yeah. well. At, yeah. And so you're doing this homegrown, though. This is in your, at, I'm assuming, in a garage somewhere. It's... I mean, it's in my room. It's, I, I'm, very per <laughs> I'm very close to it. So it's like, the thing is, what, what happens is you, you have a limit, and the limit could be the distance between your hand and the cup, but you have to work within that limit. So it's, it's, it's one of those things where um, I think whatever you own, you can use. So it's like you, you have this fake spaceship. You know, if you were to put it with dramatic lighting and then put a green screen behind it, you could probably chroma key it out and use it with shots you already captured and then it would be like a model spaceship tra traveling, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, it's what what it goes down is if you have enough interest, you can do anything. But then you'll get two views on YouTube. That's that's the biggest challenge. Yeah, but if you're the artist that just doesn't care, if you're the if you're the um, um, Van Gogh who never gets appreciated in his lifetime, but creates something that later generations do appreciate. Maybe. I mean, I still think it's worth creating. Oh, absolutely. A hundred to ten percent, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I was going to ask you, too. Um, you've got it all set up in your room right now. Oh, yeah. You're a fairly orderly person, as, I, as I've... Oh, no. Not, not in classic orderly sense, but there are certain um, reliable... There's certain reliabilities to your environment that you're looking for. I, I've seen, anyway. I mean, am I wrong on that? I could be wrong I mean, on that. What I need is so enough. I was, I was wondering how the set kind of plays into that for you. Well, you want the camera to be not too close to the the actors because you want the environment to be part of the story. So then you you have to shrink down your set. Yeah, but I mean, you live in the room. You personally, it's in your bedroom, right? Yeah, I live in the room. So how does that work day to day? You've got a set that you're walking around. I yeah, don't... yeah, I just walk past it. You just walk past it. Yeah. Does it give you a piece to know that the project project is kind of there and? You know what it feels like? It feels like it's it's kind of like you're you're floating, like you're just floating, and then you're like because the thing is, you know, when you start animating, you're not going to spend an hour; you're going to spend four, you know. Yeah. And so the thing is, what you have to do is you have to be like, oh, okay, it's there, but then. Then when I want to do it, you know, it's it's not nothing's gonna stand in my way. Mm -hmm. You know. If, so for me, uh, I have trouble switching into the creative gear. Oh. Uh -oh. So the more obstacles I can remove between me and doing something creative, the better. Um, and so that putting it in my room, I'd love to do that. My wife would kill me though. Uh -huh. So that's why it's here instead. Because I mean, this is a pool table. This is, we pull these panels off. This is this should be socializing area, and instead it's. It's my creative space. I've got a 3D printer over there. Uh, I've got um, some of my writing stuff that I do over there. I've got, uh, I'm building an electric car downstairs. Oh, I mean, whoa, whoa. Like, <laughs> awesome. This whole shop is a plethora of little projects that I can bounce between. Because oh. I, I, I don't know if I'm a ADD. I don't think I am. But I started operating as if I was. Oh, okay. And it's a weird place to be because I've become much more effective in my creativity this way. Oh, nice. You, you end up bouncing around, but instead of trying to like pigeonhole yourself, trying to control yourself to stay on one thing and not really making much progress on it, I make tons of progress 
on a ton of stuff. Oh, uh-huh. And then eventually one's done, and it's like, oh, there, there, bye, go away, next. <laughs> and I, I didn't know. I was thinking it sounded like that might be a little bit for you too, because you've got it right in front of you. You got a couple of things going on. You're doing some 2D. You're doing some 3D. I mean, with with 3D, you you have to have the set. So it's like, okay, you know. So I actually have characters that I haven't, that aren't. I'm not animated because I, I haven't had the set built for them. You know, so they, they're collecting dust. You know, crying to be animated. But I'm looking forward to you doing them because everything that I've seen you make that's been just little test screens, you know, for the most part. You've done a couple of other things that I've watched, but um, they're so packed with emotion. It's so moving that these these characters, these creatures that are dying to be made, yep. I genuinely think you're, you're going to brighten people's world when you do it. Oh. Ooh. And you might do it with some melancholy. You might, like one of the ones that you uh, you posted ended up showing the claymation character crying uh, at a reaction. Uh, and it was, it was, it just ripped my heart. Oh, it's, it's, it's 75 frames, you know? Yeah. And it was, it was perfect. And we need more of that in the world, I think. <laughs> because there's, you know, we're, we were talking about it. There's all this fluff. Martin Scorsese doesn't even think of uh, superhero movies as film. Oh. <laughs> it's like, man, that's a reach. It's the oldest type of storytelling we've got. Is the it myths? Yeah, the, yeah. It's like, but to his point, maybe it's not, maybe film is a different thing than the the great stories of all time. I don't know. I think, I think what film is, is kind of what you're too afraid to say. They're they're the, they're the mask you wear when you're trying to show your true face. The Batman cliche. Mm. And so, so if I'm Making a film, I don't think it's something necessarily I want to show, but I show it anyway through the film, and then people see it. You know, it's like, why do I have this this kind of you know, uh, kind of this love story and drama of like a family in this the middle of this horror film? That doesn't make any sense. But I think if you watch the film, you're like. If you know me, you'll be like, oh, that's why it, it kind of... I think it's what happens is you reveal your true self through your art, but not all of it, you know, part of it. I don't think you can do all of it in one project. No, definitely I think, not. I think we're too complex for that. And I like what you're saying. I, I feel the exact same way. Proper filmmaking is... I heard somebody say it so well. He's like, if I could write down what I'm trying to say... I would just write it down. Oh, yeah. But what I'm doing is I'm dabbling with the parts of me that I don't have the words for. The words for it are the movie. Yeah. Right? You want to know what I'm trying to say? Watch the movie, and it's all the things that you feel along the way. Oh, yeah. If I could write it down, I would just write it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd make a different movie. Yeah. But, yeah, it sounds kind of like what you're describing there. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, what what I, I do want to end this on is... On, to to end this on a funsy. Yeah, we going for the end. We the, can go for yeah, the end. let's go for we, the end. Yeah, we should probably do that because I'm looking at the time. At, what are we at? We're at a little more than an hour. We're doing pretty good. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, uh, and I know. I I think I saw somebody looking to pick you up. Am I still taking you home? I don't mind taking you home. I'll I'll call. <laughs> okay, we'll figure it out. Uh. So you wanted to end on a a note. Yeah, a note note about dri- distribution because I think hmm. I think the thing is. Film festivals have a place, but the place is in the same place as the internet. Mm-hmm. So if you just want the the view count, the internet, but if you're like, oh, I want to see a small crowd get emotionally, yeah, you know, Con- connected, connected, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's where I think it comes in. So um, I have trouble connecting emotionally with people, like day to day. Um, do you think? For some of us, that's what film is a proxy for. When we create a film and you see people like weep at connecting in the intimate parts of you that you put into that film. Is that how we're connecting and becoming part of society? I, I think the the difficulty is it's it's it it could be true, it could be false, but I don't think it's 
untrue. I think it's conditional because if if I'm a grumpy guy and I want to make a pleasant movie, I'll do that. And if I'm a pleasant guy and everyone's mad at me for bossing them around, they'll they'll churn up a performance that'll make people stressed. You know. Well, and that's so, because film is more than just what ends up on the print. Oh, definitely. It's, yeah. It's an experience. It's mm -hmm. you know. It's, I think that's why movies like um, Smokey and the Bandit. Oh, uh, you can't recreate it because there was a chemistry on set that produced something that oh. was contagiously enjoyable. To to me, it's like that with the original Ghostbusters. Like, yeah. you, it's literally the cast that I think makes the movie the feel the way it does. And so the thing is, it's 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 kind of like I, I think with art, you're your moral obligation is to make the best art you can. Mm. You know? Well, and if you're doing what we're talking about doing, if if I'm presenting the deepest, most intimate parts of my soul, maybe not the deepest, most intimate, but parts of my soul just in general, don't I want to do it justice? Don't I want to oh, yeah. do it with some reverence of who I am? And then... It's not just me either. You know, you're the lead filmmaker, but you're coming in alongside other people who are filmmaking with you. So it's these little pieces of souls all coming oh, together. Let's bury the auteur theory. Let's just bury it. The which one? The auteur theory. Go for it. I uh, don't know what you're talking about. Oh, oh, okay. Um, in film school, mm -hmm. um, they teach you that one person is responsible for everything good in a movie, and it's like. Do they really? More or less, yeah. That's hogwash. That is hogwash. That's absolute hogwash. It, and here's here's where I'll argue it. Joss Whedon Productions. Oh, wow. Joss Whedon builds a cast that enters into the creative process with him. If you look at Firefly, you look at Dollhouse, you look at uh, Avengers. Nice. I'm not going to count Age of Ultron. That was a no, bit he of a, was pressured. That was a bit yeah. of a miss. But you look at what he works. He's... There's no one person who's the king of that. Oh, wow. Can you tell me Nathan Fillion is the one that kills it and just makes Dr. Horrible sing along blog? No. Can you tell me it's Neil Patrick Harris? Felicia Day. Joss Whedon himself. Jed Whedon no. with the music writing. I mean, there's just no, there's no foundation for this theory that they're presenting. They, they seriously put this in film school. Yeah, they put this stuff... That the director is like this, this person who does everything, and you're like, wait, producers hire directors, studios hire producers. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's a lot of pieces, it, and then you're fighting for creative control <laughs> the whole time because you think you're this end all be all. Director. Oh, of course, of course. It's ridiculous. You're yeah. just breeding tension that's not productive. Oh man, bear. <laughs> I mean. Yeah. Exactly. Ah. Uh, uh, well, it's no wonder I'm seeing this. It never made sense to me when I would see this. Yeah, that that way you can tell the people who have gone to film school because they're all kind of, you know, high Top on down. The, yeah, it's like yeah, it's like okay, you're you're still at the bottom, you know. Yeah, well, not even that. Just bring everybody to your level. Oh yeah. Right. Because you're not going to create it without them. Oh, exactly. And trust me, if you make your perfect vision. It won't be as good as it could have been if you'd allowed it to kind of grow on its own. Oh, 110%. Here's where I get where I think the Iron Giant destroys the auteur theory is that Brad Bird would take every idea that was good from his crew to work on the story, and the movie is one of the best movies ever made. Hands down. Uh, I would argue in anime we saw that with Evangelion. It was just incredible what they pulled off with that. Um, and it was just, it was a group effort. It yeah. Was a group effort. Uh, who else? I mean, gosh, we could just go down the line. I mean, all right. So n to make the counterpoint, though. Okay. Because there's we're just ideologues if we only look at one side. <laughs> oh, exactly. Um, uh, Kubrick. Oh, uh, Kubrick. Kubrick. Kubrick did a lot of different movies, though. Mm -hmm. He he made different movies with different styles. Yeah, but he was a stickler for the image that he was trying to oh, produce. Yeah. What is it, 127 takes? It's one of the I famous mean, Yeah, but references. the thing is, 
you know, a stick in the mud director doesn't necessarily make for a good movie all the time. No, but his did is to yeah. my, is my point. It's like he's a good. I think he's a good supporting example of the theory. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean. But I, but I also wonder what could Kubrick have made if he had had a few more Kubricks on his team that would have worked together to create something even even grander. Uh, I mean, in a way, it's it's kind of like the the thing is crowdfunding is like the ultimate death of the author celebration because you mm. have every person making a little bit of a movie um, until until it's like a project of its own and not one voice. And I think there's more speciality as a result of that than just like, you know, you know, I'm a director, dang it. You know? Yeah, I mean, if I wanted to see a, a, if I wanted to see one man's voice or one woman's voice or one, Gender fluid voice. Oh, care. I careful. Would, <laughs> I would go see a one person show. Oh, yeah. A one act theater. drama. Definitely. One act, one actor. Yep. No. I would, I would watch that. I would watch that. Two hours. But that's, yeah. But that's, that's, that's so one dimensional. Oh, yeah. It's total. And what it does is it makes students want to fire everyone else so they can be the guy, you know? Well, and that's the problem is if they approach it that way, everybody will quit anyway. Yeah. And they will be that guy. Like, how many producers and how many directors have been left holding the bag because somebody wouldn't work with them anymore? Oh, hundreds. Right? I said, <laughs> I, I'm not thinking of any, though, all of a sudden. You you got any? Uh, you Who know, walked off set? Uh, who walked off set? Was it... Phoenix, who walked off set? Did he? Once. Wow. Like, something crazy. And you're like, wait, you're an actor. You should stay on set, you know? Yeah, but, I mean, I'm wondering, too, like, directors of photography. Um, oh, no, they, who, they'd be... Who gave up directing a movie recently? Oh, no, Brian Singer was fired. Singer was fired, um, which I wonder why. Oh. Do you know why? I, I don't, don't know why. I don't want to... Um... But, like, so Singer was fired. There have been others, though, who quit, like, mid-project and moved on to something else. Ah. And you don't quit a project. You quit a boss, typically. Yeah, yeah. So what was that EP like to work with is kind of what I'm getting at. Like, oh, man. And that, you just start driving people away, and then you end up with just crap. <laughs> but. I don't know. We've we've seen some good stuff come out, uh, some good creative content come out of really bad relationships on set. What was it? Mash. Pretty much nobody got along. That's on the set funny. Of Mash. I think it was. Uh, that, they, that tends to happen with a lot of love interests. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I wonder too if it's just a, a barrier that they put up so that they don't actually fall in love. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. Like, no, I have to hate them so that I won't actually love them like yeah. I do on screen because <laughs> my husband will kill me for it. Yeah. Uh, what was the other thing? What was film school like? Oh dear. Uh, and you know. Oh we... yeah, I'm definitely gonna answer. The answer is is kind of like. I I think it's complicated because it's given me opportunities I wouldn't otherwise have, mm -hmm. and so I'm I'm fair to that. And it also, it also was more of a typing exercise and i'm like oh wait some people make movies you <laughs> know so that's <laughs> it's it's that dichotomy of that that tension in between its highs and lows you know that i i can't answer but i can say you know it to me what it gave me was that sense of work work ethic because mm. I had a project, and I was done completely with the visuals. Like, I locked the picture, and he's like, you're not done. And I'm like, what? And then the thing is, me and my classmates just spent hours just trashing the movie in the in a good way. Yeah. Like, putting film decay and whatnot. And what that did is, it just made me realize, you're not done until you feel like you've reached as high artistically as you can. Mm. And with that... That it meant putting filters on it, but like, yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, so, so I think that work ethic is something that stayed with me. But I, I think the teaching stuff is is something that's more just, you know, 
it's it's something that you 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 wish could stay with you, but you kind of have to let go, you know. Mm. I really, I a part of me really wanted to go. Oh man! So many times. Um, yeah, I won't be that guy that almost enlisted right now, but I did mm. very much. I was on the threshold of going to film school. Part of me still wishes I had. I think what you should do is you should see if you can get into a film grad school and that that way you can just be like Professor Chase, you know. <laughs> you know. Well, if I could speak uh competently to all the subjects that I mean, obviously my lighting needs work, my camera angles all need work. Uh, I'm no professor. What I am is a fan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But it's easier, you know, it's just like that old saying, uh, you can always critique the man in the arena, but it's the guy that actually goes in and throws down that that counts. And you went in, and, I mean, I watched you through the journey. You overcame Ugh. a lot of obstacles, man. You, yeah. You were getting hit with just, you know, from your personal life, just whammies. And then from the school, of course, they, they're supposed to challenge you, so you get yeah. hit with those whammies. Oh, just, yeah. Those oh. Artif- okay. What I have to do is I have to put down the fist. I think gateway classes are a terrible idea. What's a gateway class? A gateway class is a class that they make super hard on purpose so that overly competitors, overly competitive majors don't all make it in. So what it is is it's like fake difficulty. So it's like having the first level of the video game be the hardest level. You know? Okay. So... I, I I don't know. I I I I think it's understandable, but it's also tragic because why don't you let students decide for themselves if they're gonna fail something and go on a different track than just be like, okay, you learned you learned the camera shots. Now now tell me, is this a track or a zoom? Like <laughs> yeah, well that's so that's the diff- That's one of the things that I think all schools are having to re or they're not having to. They should be asking themselves, what are we doing? Yeah. Are we certifying people's knowledge that they already have? Mm. Or are we facilitating the curiosity to learn more about a subject they're passionate about? The the trouble with film school is you get different types. You mm. know, you get the, the gearheads who, who know everything and could probably teach the class. And then you get the people who just... They they really should have been communications majors, but they 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 took the film route and they're like what? And then you get the people who are interested in the themes, but don't seem to have a voice of their own. And I think the challenge is is to get them to all work together, but that's that's pretty hard. And yeah, well, I mean, it's that's why not everybody's an artist. I mean, everybody I think has the capacity to be an artist of some form. It's a matter of finding their art. Oh yeah. Um, some, for some people it's actually building cars, for some people it's painting, I mean music, it it just spans the gamut. And if you don't experiment with all of them, you'll never know which one's yours. Oh yeah. Uh, I forget where I was going with that, but it was somewhere spectacular, I promise. Oh, you were talking (laughs) about artists and film school and school and... Yeah, and I just feel like you're crushing so many artists... By doing what you're talking about. There's, there's a chance to foster something there. Yeah, exactly. That's really, I think, a divine spark. Oh, yeah. And they're just dumping poop on it. D- yeah. It's, but at the same time, it again, it's what is the aim of the school? I mean, and I, don't, I, I don't know. I don't even know. And I've, I've been through the program because I think... I don't think they know. Yeah. I think they're here to make money. Oh, no, no. You didn't just say that. Why not? <laughs> you did not. Uh, you, they they are a business. Oh, yeah. right. They're getting government subsidiz- subsidization. Oh yeah. Right, and they're incentivized to keep their rates high. Oh yeah. And to keep their books high, like oh yeah, all this stuff. And what you're doing is you're investing in a hope. <laughs> you're coming out, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in debt for the hope of what you could do with your knowledge. Yeah. That does not seem like quid pro quo for me. <laughs> I mean, like, it's, it's... It's potential, I get it, but... I think the thing is, any... Here's something uh, university people shouldn't listen to, so plug your ears. Um, like, <laughs> anything you learn 
in a university you can learn in community college. Like yes. literally anything. So I mean, Ivy League, <laughs> I will argue Ivy League still has a place. Oh, well, those places. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. for the most part, what the universities have become is an HR screening process. Oh. They're just, it's, HR, HR departments in corporations use a four-year degree as a method of just screening out applicants. Oh. That's it. Yeah. Uh, and it's, I mean, I get it. If you want an industrialized society, it makes sense that you would just have a ladder for people to climb, and if they don't climb the ladder they don't do great things but then you've got the outliers the real issue now is i can go take a class in directing from ron howard on masterclass oh and it'll probably be a better class and what's great is he's not the only director martin scorsese's doing oh, one as well no, not so, like spike lee almost made me sign up i'm like yeah yeah spike yeah. lee he has that passion and you're like okay i'm <laughs> i'm so, it's you know. Penn and Teller, Chris Voss, and Ron Howard for me. So it's Spike Lee. Anybody Danny else? Elfman. Yeah, Danny Elfman. I forgot he's doing one. <laughs> and it's the future. It's, That's how it's going to be. Here's the other thing about it is it's um, we're at a point now where you don't have to do a hundred classes on something. No. If you do no. a good one and distribute it, you can do it. It'll too. keep working. You update them periodically, right? But now we've got different filmmakers, different teachers competing in a free market to where only the best ones will continue doing it. Oh, yeah. Because only the best ones will get subscriptions. Oh, so that... So now we're actually... We're creating a free market university that's a heck of a lot cheaper. Which is... I mean, yeah. it was the natural direction for all these super universities. They're just going to crumble. Oh, man. They need to update their model. Oh, um... Ding... Just, I mean, you've been there. Uh, it... It, yeah, what it is, is it's, to me, it's like being in a museum and then realizing why you don't go to a museum every day. Yeah. And it's, yeah. and I think it's because, and I don't want to be too spooky, it's like, because you feel like dead people are actually there. Like, that's probably the well, creepiest way to put about Figuratively, it. they are, right? So if you go and you actually start reading what the brilliant minds put down on paper and seeing how they saw the world and drawing your own conclusions yeah. from that, you do that properly, you have a great chance there to do some great things and, and oh, wake yeah. up the person you could be, right? Oh, ideal, yeah. Yeah, but they're not fostering that. Oh, snap. It's, it's an industry now. I'm sorry. Come on, figure. It's one of the reasons that, as a homeschooler, I was growing up, and I'm looking at it going, why would I go there? Oh, snap. I, we're in an internet age. Like, I was there at the... You know, what, 1994, we could say, is really when the internet takes off. Barely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and even in 1997, I'm going, I'm finding everything in the encyclopedia, because I had all the encyclopedias. Oh, that's funny. Right? Yeah. Uh, I'm finding that in two seconds, searching Netscape. Netscape, ooh. Netscape and ah. Yahoo. Oh, oh yeah, hey, yeah. Because I was not going to get on that Google bandwagon. That was no. destined to fail. No. Nope. Shows how smart I am. Uh, yeah, it's just it's it was already starting a show is obsolete to me because I'm in love with adopting the knowledge. Oh, I yeah. don't care about the credentials. Oh, me neither. And that's why I think. Okay. Shut the the thing off. Just no. Kidding. Come on. Um, the best teachers are usually the ones with the low IMDb credits because they know how to teach really well because they're spending more time teaching than doing things. I think know? they genuinely care. Yeah. You, you've got only so much time in this life. Are you yeah. going to spend it teaching people to foster their skills or are you going to spend it showing off your skills? Oh, I mean, that's that's the trouble with with tutorials is half of them are like, I can do this well. And you're like, okay, that's why you did it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the thing is, is showing off your skills. There's, there's a process to that um, that is a different process. When you t sit, tell people how they ma you made the movie, it's like th it's their window into your mind, you know? And so when I'm like, oh, and I had this character appear at this time, it's like I'm showing you how I'm thinking. So it's there's a kind of vulnerability about behind the scenes that 
I don't think non-filmmakers have. It's like if you write a book, you just say, here's the book. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's true of musicians for some reason. I think it's unique to film, and that's my personal opinion. No, I think you're right. I think that's one of the things that Masterclass is doing well is you know, it could have flopped. If you had just had Ron Howard come teach a class, you don't know if he's a teacher. Uh, he, he's an incredible filmmaker. Yep. Incredible actor. I love him in everything he's done. Oh, yeah. Um, he might really suck at teaching. But if you've got a whole crew of brilliant teachers that can teach teaching, now you can coach all the talents. And you can do it in multiple takes because they're not in front of a class. Oh, nice. They don't have to grade the papers. You have somebody else do that kind of thing. And you've... You've found that way to take that spark of brilliance that's talent and make it teachable. I think that's the real mastermind element of Masterclass. I'm looking forward to seeing other schools start doing that. I mean, I think the fu the future of, of school is the Internet. Like, I'm not saying, I mean, you might be saying, but I'm not saying universities are bad. I th just think they're operating in a 21st, 20th century model, and this is the 21st century, and, you know, subscription base is how, how education is going to be done. Mm -hmm. But I think maybe some of that is people just want to hold on to, to students that they can foster this traditional method so they, they bear down. It's like, why do I have to take a class in um, European culture, it's like, <laughs> you know, the culture of Switzerland. What does Switzerland yeah. have to do with my movie making? Well, it yeah. used to be back in the day when you went to university, you were to be made into a gentleman. Or oh, a lady, wow. Right? And when you're a gentleman, when you're of that breed, when you're of that elite, there's a certain breadth of knowledge that's expected of you. So that made sense to me. But that's not what we're doing anymore. What no. we're doing is we're charging a ton yep. for you to get a stamp of approval. Yep. It's like, you know what? Just like Reliant K said, I can take calligraphy and make my own fake degree. <laughs> I can get it on the web and hack my own credentials if I wanted to. If I really, really wanted to, if you, uh -huh. it'd be a heck of a lot cheaper to do fraud like that than it would be to go get a proper degree. And if you looked at my work ethic in one year of, be of employment... Let's say you didn't discover that I'd faked it until a year into me having a job. Right? Oh, you, you will have gotten that experience. Well, you've gotten the experience, but then compare me to my peers. Yeah. And do I fit in? Do I deserve to be here? Then didn't I deserve the degree? Oh, man. It's, the trouble is that gets tricky. Well, because, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because the, the, the trouble is, okay... Okay, now I'm going to take off all the film school listeners, but it seemed like the more interesting the person was in how they understood a project, the, the less likely they, they were to get the, the class assignment done, handed to them. And mm. I think it's because there's kind of a reliability bias, and so if you're very interesting, it's like... <laughs> well, the interesting people don't fit in the box, right? Oh, yeah. And all they want to do is, at the end of the day, check the box saying, yes, you did this, yes, yeah. you did that. It's like, it could be so much more than that. It oh. was so much more than that. Now, I'm not saying there's an intentionality. I think there might be in some places, but br broad scale, I think it's just the trap that all businesses fall into. Every oh. business model falls into this. You just start doing the same old thing, charging as much as you can, and if you can get the government in on subsidizing loans and insuring loans, and then, you yeah. know, you can't... You know, you can't declare bankruptcy on school debt. That is wild. You are an indentured servant for your knowledge. Yeah. Well, certification of your knowledge. Uh, that, that's, does that seem right to you? No, nah, right. I, I, it blew my mind when I heard this. Uh, I mean, so we bashed film school, or not film school, we've bashed some school. School, school. I've, bashed I've, school. I've, I've bashed the, the school <laughs> philosophy a bit. Yeah. But really, at the end of the day, I I don't think it's, necessarily malevolent no of course not. overall no <laughs> but i do think it's an outdated model that is just like newspapers about to die oh, if they don't update their model and i think master class is a good glimpse of what universities should be doing it's free market high-end education with the best and brightest minds in the business or in i the mean it, that's where it's going the internet is kind of 
The so, behemoth. So where are you going? Oh. What's next for John? What, where do you want to be with your art? Let's see. I know that's a big, ter- sharp turn. Oh, but... big. Where do I want to? I think where I want to be my, with my art is when when I come to the point where I realize it doesn't have to be perfect. Mm. You know, I think that's when you start to mature as an artist, when, when you're like, that's not perfect, that's okay. So, um, so yeah, this is how I think. I bought a um, hundred sheets of transparency paper, but like to, to use as, as a film cell. And what what I realized is I couldn't make those big drawings without being a nightmare to organize. So I bought like smaller paper. So now it's going to be less good drawing, but it'll be real paper. And But given your your vision for that art, it's a worthy sacrifice itself. Oh, yeah. yeah. Getting it made versus getting it perfect. You know? Sounds like you're growing. Yeah. I think there's a balance there, right? you got to find where it's it's a compromise that doesn't take away from the experience. Because I mean, there are some compromises. Yeah, I could say, yeah, this is good enough. And it would actually take away from the overall experience, but then it wouldn't be good enough, right? I mean... I think you're doing a good job of finding that line. I think the, the thing is... The the question you have to ask yourself is it is it are, am I saying it's good enough because it's easy for me, or was it would it actually be harder to to make the move like would it be easier? To, I think the point comes when you are asking yourself if it would be harder emotionally to let the movie go, or to fix the problems because when it you've gotten to the point that it's hard for the movie to be it what it is i think that's the point where you have to let it go because the movie's the movie and it's like if you want an even better movie start from the ground up and make another one but like oh man i mean i, I agree with you yeah <laughs> you know sometimes it grows into something that it was never supposed to be yeah temple of doom i think is a good example of that and they just didn't I mean, you can't pull the plug on a big budget production like that. Oh, Symbol of Doom is. I'm I'm going to defend that one because oh wow that okay. that film has some of the best action scenes in film. Totally agree. Has some of the best si- cinematography in film. Yeah. Harrison Ford is badass, and he worked hard. He he wasn't he wasn't like that in Last Crusade. He he was good in Last Crusade, but he was just soft during Last Crusade. Mm-hmm. They so took some he, edge off. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's like everything but the story itself was good. But that's a really big problem. That's a huge thing. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, it's like Shankira Stone's World Peace. It's like, where does Indy care about that to begin with? I mean, that's his first movie, but why not start with something smaller and build up his character from there? And yeah. Batman begins it, which is anachronistic. But Yeah, but. well, it sounds like they were trying to do a... Uh, they were trying to do a cinematic version of what Supernatural ended up being. Oh. Uh, because now we've got, f- they're finishing up their 15th season. Oh, the They could net. still be going if they wanted to. They're ca- calling it quits. Oh, that's and funny. And what they've done is they've gone after all these great pieces of of legend and folklore uh-huh. and myth uh-huh. and religion. It's, it's really neat. And that, that I know they were trying to do kind of a James Bond thing with Indiana Jones. Well, and I think they were they just took off they bit off more than they could chew with the spectrum of things that he could address. Well, the thing is Indiana Jones is a James Bond riff off. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of like they're trying to make it more of but honestly, I don't know. I feel like Temple of Doom is the worst story, but Crystal Skull is oh. <laughs> No. Crystal Skull that is That movie doesn't exist. Yeah, it, even, I think even Dan Aykroyd would say that it's, movie's it's, bad. What it is, he's is a it's huge, a Lester mummy at this point. He's a huge fan of Crystal Skull, or Crystal Skulls in general. I, I guess that's what I think of it, is you have the three, the Indiana Jones trilogy and the mummy, and they're one movie. No. No. <laughs> no. Maybe. Maybe, perhaps. <laughs> but I really like the mummy. I like it. <laughs> Which yeah. I hated. I hated for the, it took me four times watching it. 
before I decided to start liking it a little bit. It's because I didn't get the camp. It's supposed to be camp. I thought it was it's supposed to be parody. scary. And I no, kept, it's not yeah, scary. I, it's, it's, it's amazing what the mindset that you go into watching a movie with No, it's changes so much. Yeah. What it is is it's like, basically, if Indiana Jones had no pride, yeah. he would make that movie. It's like a, It's an ultimate favorite of mine now, which is crazy. Oh, no, whoa, okay. Absolutely whoa. hating it to, oh. it's it's a staple. Uh, it's uh, Steven Summers is my favorite writer director. Oh, nice. Uh, I love Van Helsing. Yeah, oh. People can knock it all they want, but I want to see more. Now, the best part of the G.I. Joe movie he did. Oh, wow. How you get a double entendre like Rise of the Cobra in the title oh, no. of a movie. I mean, you just hang your hat on that and just be done because it's like, right. I got away with that. <laughs> I mean, it's... But other than that, I mean, Brendan Fraser was in it for like two seconds. I mean, Brendan Fraser is, to me, I think he's he's one of these people where you're like, man, life really happened in a negative way, and you're like, he didn't deserve that. Like, he didn't Mm. deserve to have all these bad things happening. You're talking about in his personal life? Just in general, like... You're like, oh man, I'll I'll put you in my movie. (laughs) You know, it's like... Absolutely. Yeah. I don't yeah. care what weight he's at either. I want him. Yeah, exactly. I'd get him and Bruce Campbell together in a movie. Ooh, and then Nathan that's Fillion. Fire, like, fire. Oh my gosh. I don't know what would happen. It will be we'll good. Just, we'll just turn on cameras and, and yeah. see. <laughs> I think what would happen would be is that you would have Fillion and Bruce Campbell sparring, trying to outact each other. Maybe and, I, Bruce. I don't know. He seems like a prima donna sometimes. Oh yeah. I, I don't get that from Villian, Fillion or from uh, um, Brendan. No, Brendan seems nice. Yeah. I, I wonder if we wouldn't have. What we could do is get Bill Shatner in there. Oh man. And then oh. see which one prima donna's the other. Oh. Which is funny because Bruce Campbell has uh, got some great stuff on being a big fan of. Shatner. Oh, that's really weird. Yeah, he uh, that's um um Ash versus Evil Dead. He does a handbrake turn at oh, the man. beginning that he learned from Bill Shatner in a green room uh because he was a huge fan of TJ Hooker. That's fine. Yeah, right? It's like he asked him about like when you're going to go up to a famous actor, apparently you're supposed to pick something like niche that shows you're actually a fan. Like you don't go up and tell Mark Hamill, "Hey, great job with Luke Skywalker." No, no, no. Right. I mean, I would go with, what is it? Wolverine. You have to go with Wolverine because the thing is, it, everyone knows he's Skywalker. Most people know he's the Joker. But if you're like, man, you... You're, you're blowing you, my mind right now. He was Wolverine? Yeah, he was. In the animated series? And No, but he was in one of them. Like... Which one? He was in one of them. I, I do not know. Probably okay. a straight to video movie. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, like, that works. I like video him in Chuck. Game. He had a great cameo in Chuck. I, I loved it. That's um, nice. Chuck's a great one for a bunch of cameos like that. Chevy Chase was hilarious in, in Oh, Chuck. man, Chevy Chase. like the... Yeah, we well, put Chevy <laughs> Chase in there for a prima donna. Oh, no, <laughs> he, he just, he'd tear down the movie. Oh, like, wow, like, wow, wow, wow. I, I would love to know Chevy Chase. Uh, I feel like he's gotten a reputation oh. that's pretty harsh, and I don't know that it's not well-deserved, oh. but... Uh, I'm such a fan of the mind that it took to put together the characters that he did. Funny Farm is still one of my favorite mm-hmm. movies. And it's just great. It's just solid work. Three Amigos. Oh, yeah. The the prissy. I never would have expected him to go prissy with the character. That's funny. And it's, it's brilliant. I love it. So I would love to know him. Plus, you know, I'm kind of an asshole myself. <laughs> Maybe we'd hang out and get along. <laughs> Maybe we'd like each other. Who knows? Who's uh, who's somebody you wish you could meet, oh. spend some time with? Oh man, in the oh. industry, living or? Oh, well, let's do both. Okay. Living, we'll do living first. Okay, living. Yeah, and then let's... we'll do in history, living or dead. Okay, living. Um, let's see. Hmm, mm. that it's it's funny. When you think about living people, it's like, oh, everyone, but yeah. not, yeah. So I think um, if I wanted to do, 
talk to someone living, I would probably choose Shirley MacLaine because she would probably know know a lot of old directors and I yeah. like it. That's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Okay, deceased Jimmy Stewart. Like Wow. The lazy eye from American Tale, Five Will Goes West. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. my gosh. I loved the voice that he brought to that character. It was one of his last roles. It was, oh, yeah. It was, it was his late. last role, I think. It was in the 80s, way way late in the game. It would have been 90, I think. Wasn't oh, man. I, I don't know. I, I think it's 90. Because I saw it in theaters. Oh, wow. I remember seeing it. So he's got to be post you know, post-88, because my memory goes back to about the age of four pretty well, I think. Um, yeah, Jimmy Stewart, that's a that's a solid one. And let's see, who who wouldn't I not like to meet? Who would I... Yeah. Oh, okay. I think the person I would not like to meet would be... Um... Kubrick, ironically, like, because mm. the thing is, I would have to be in the position where I'm like, I like who you are, but I don't like how you deal with people. Mm. You know, it's like what you did in The Shining was terrible, you know. Um, what do you do in The Shining? Basically, he stressed, uh, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, the actress, uh, Shelley Duvall until she was like really terrified and it it works well but like it's it's not nice you know and so so it's like the thing is I, I couldn't be at this level of I admire you but I, I think you're you're kind of cruel I guess that's true of a Do lot of Do you think he's the cruelest? I think the cruelest has got to be Tobe Huber because Tobe Huber when the the girl was hanging from a meat hook. He used a real cable, and he didn't use a hook, obviously, but he let her be in pain until the scene was over. And it's like, that's not how to treat actors, you know? We're not going to go Ned Beatty, uh, squeal like a piggy. Ooh. Oh, no. We're not going to say that director uh, went no. further? Oh. We're going to blame the actor on that one? I'm... I mean, Last Tango in Paris, like, that's like, no, don't do that to anybody. Like, yeah. you know, it's like you, you, you treat actors like they are people first and fragile ego second, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. People surrounded by fragile egos and you're like, okay, you did fine. And then, you know, then request another take. You know, you don't, you know, treat them like they're subhuman just because there in your movie. You know? I just read about Mel Brooks uh, with the... Who is it? I forget the guy's name. It's in um, Robin Hood Men in Tights. The antagonist. Oh, Alan Rickman? No, the... Oh, no, that's the real movie. Yeah, that's the, actually... The <laughs> that's, serious... that's the movie they were parodying. No, the, um, the guy that plays the... Not the king, but the, the fake king. No, you know who I'm talking about. Um, apparently, he got a bout of hepatitis. Yeah. It was hepatitis A. He's laying in a hospital. He had one more scene to shoot. Mm. It was two lines. And Mel Brooks continued to bug him at the hospital. Oh, dear. Until they, <laughs> he talked him into doing it. Now, we got men in tights out of it. Mm. Uh, I, you know, it's considered his second, I think his second best work. Mel Brooks' is second best work. But... uh. Yeah, just some of the stories you hear sometimes. It's, I mean, I get it. You really want to do it. That fragile ego thing. But you also look at Mel Brooks. He's been in the business for a while. He's like, ah, I've seen worse. I bet this guy could really do it. We just got to talk him into it. He's fine. He'll be fine. We'll get him. We'll take him in the ambulance. We'll pull him out, shoot the scene, put him right back, take him right back to the hospital. He'd be 20 minutes. No big deal. I mean, really where we're... Where people are getting the short end of the stick is is the stunt people, you know, because for sure. Because the thing is, if they do a dangerous stunt, they won't get much glory, or you know, might not get. But with CGI, you could just have an entire CGI scene, and and I guess the trouble is, what's the ethics of that? Mm. Um, 
do I have a CGI do double doing outrageous stunt, or do I just not have the stunt in the movie? Or do you find that guy that really wants to do that stuff? Oh, ethics. There, there are guys that are that want to do that. Oh, I'm man. one of those guys. I would, you would, I would <laughs> stunt driving. I would love to do stunt driving. Oh man, love to do stunt they'd, driving. They'd have to. If, if open anybody up. wants me, I, I'll do it right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just put me in anything. I've, I've got a tank license. I've flown airplanes. <laughs> like, oh, uh, let's just do it. Whatever it is, <laughs> send full send. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, you got to have a. It's more about safety than it is about the stunt these days. Yeah. Uh, I think Tom Cruise is doing a great job of that. The guy's gone from being, you know, a guy that's basically a guaranteed $100 million box office draw to being one of the, being a great stunt coordinator. Oh, yeah. Um, really enjoyed seeing some of the behind the scenes stuff of uh, Rogue Nation and some of the other Mission Impossible stuff. But um, and I think you're right. The stunt guy's... We're we're hitting this point, but I we were talking earlier about the rubber band snapping back. We're starting to see more of the practical effects. Oh yeah, it's there might that, be that chance. I think there will be as 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 TV becomes more grounded. Mm. You know, I think I think that as TV becomes more realism focused, we'll see more of that practical work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I had a lot of hope when I saw Ray Park as Darth Maul. And then he got a couple of roles after that because you know Ray Parkley was a martial arts stuntman. Oh, nice! And um, that he was the he was one of the headless horsemen in Sleepy Hollow. Oh, nice! Which is, if any, anybody knows, it's Christopher Walken is the actor. No, Ray Park is the headless horseman who has no head who does the martial arts parts. <laughs> oh, that's funny, <laughs> right? But he was also Darth Maul of all people, and he was also Toad. In the first X Men movie, um, but just you know, a little he's 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 solid stunt, solid stunt guy, and was getting some roles. I liked seeing that crossover and maybe getting some of that recognition. That's cool. Yeah, uh, stunt guys are the voice actors of on screen. I think. Uh, that's, I mean, I think the trouble, the trouble is. And I guess this goes back to local filmmaking is there are only two genres. I'm I'm saying something offensive with the hopes that someone will say something else in the comment section. Maybe they'll maybe we'll learn something new. Maybe they'll correct us. In yeah, a exactly. Yeah. But from what I've seen of all the listings around, and I, I go to all the listings, it's two genres, drama and horror. And you're like, what if I want to do a comedy? Like, who's making a comedy? Like... Nobody right now. Yeah. It's I like, bet, uh, well, I mean, other than Zach Galifianakis, who's from North Wilkesboro. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and wasn't it, um, oh, what's his name from Tropic Thunder and Pineapple Express? Ben Stiller? No, no the, um, the big guy. Oh, gosh. I say big. He's, you know, about my size. Um, um, what's his name? I can't remember his name. Der, der, der. It starts with, there's a D there. Um. But he went to the School of the Arts. I'm trying oh, to think. cool. Who is it? It's Tropic Thunder. He was the stunt guy in Tropic... He was the pyrotechnics guy. Oh, awesome. In Tropic Thunder. Ah! Oh. All right. Well, that one's going in the description below as well. Well, I'll find it. I, can, I, I knew it right up until I went to say it. <laughs> um, so I was going to ask you, too. You're looking to do some stuff. Yeah. You're looking for work. Oh, yeah. Um, I think we've done a good job of kind of exploring some of your interests and your okay. passions and what you're looking to do. Is there a way that people could contact you with some work if you were trying to get some or? Oh, I actually have a Facebook page. It's John Alston filmmaker. And so, um, so, so yeah, that's, that's literally the, the context. So, if you just find the Facebook page, you can like it, and then I can see who you are, and you know, see if you're worthy of <laughs> my my talents. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I'm um, kidding. I'm kidding. Um, yeah, no, that's great. And you're in Winston Salem, North Carolina. That right? that area, which is a yeah, the try it. roughly that area. Um, trying to think of anything else. If you wanted to learn about stop motion. Okay. 
let's say somebody watching this saw what we were talking about. It's like, man, you know what? I think that's really my art. Where could I go to learn more? Where are some places that you've learned some stuff about it? Well, well, I use the forums. There's one called Animate Clay that's really good, and stopmotionanimation.com, which is okay, but it's not as good as the Animate Clay forum. But really, um, what you have to learn is to spend one hour in, on one second. Like, you do it on your own, do an hour a second, and see how many seconds you can do. And that's really the only way it'll be good and not YouTube quality, you know, where it's like Lego videos, you know, minifigs. Man, an hour a second. Oh, yeah. 40 minutes for one second. That is, that is... Serious dedication. Yeah, what happens I is, is I usually quit after the two and a half second mark, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. No, it's a great standard, and it's a, it blows my mind. So it sounds like a great place to end, I think. Oh, yeah. But uh, it's been a pleasure having you. We should do it again sometime. Okay. We'll pick apart a movie, maybe, or something else along you know, those lines. We can start doing some uh, Cisco and Uber What could stuff. be an interesting thing is, but that could be if I double the feature. I actually, I unironically think Mask of the Phantasm is better than The Dark Knight. Oh, I do, too. Oh, uh-oh. We actually agree on that. Oh one. snap! We agree. Uh, <laughs> and on that bombshell, it's time to end. Oh yeah. Oh wait, I just stole that from a, a guy that's really famous and British. Oh snap! So I can't use that one. I, I'm sorry. Uh, no copyright infringement intended. Oh no, or it's, it's fair use. <laughs> you know. But uh, he is a hero of mine. Some of you know, and uh, so. How do you end when you don't? <laughs> <laughs> Scene. <laughs> Finn, you know. You, Finn, yeah. I like it. You know yeah. what? We'll put that in the caption at the Finn, end. Finn, yeah, we'll exactly. We'll be talking over it, and it'll be great, and we'll fade out. <laughs> Thanks, John. Okay.